Welcome once again to the Big Tire Garage and one of our Q&A sessions. Now, as you know by now, I ask a question in any of my YouTube videos. I randomly select those questions and answer them here. If you hear your question being answered, you shoot me an email, bigtiregarage at gmail.com, and then I send you a sticker pack in the mail. Now the good news is we just got our designs in for the Colorado sticker. That's the Colorado that I built to take on Ultimate Adventure last year. And I have to get that off to the sticker printer at Sticker Bros. And once that is done, we'll add that to that sticker pack and we're gonna put it on the Shopify store to have it for sale. For those of you that just want to buy stickers, help support the channel, you can go there and you can buy stickers, iron-on patches. We're still working on some limited edition t-shirts. We're just getting all of our sizing lined up. We'll probably get those out eh, maybe April, probably after Easter Jeep and we'll have those available. All right, so without any further ado, let's thank this week's video sponsor and that is Brunt workwear. Now, not too long ago, well actually it was quite a while ago, Brunt Workwear reached out to me and asked me to review their work boots. And I told them that I have no problem doing that, but I'm not going to take a set of boots, pull it out of a box, wear it for two days, and then tell you how great they are. I am going to put them through the paces here inside the shop. So I have been wearing the Marin 8 inch composite toe work boot here in the shop for just about eight months now, every single day working. And I have to say that I'm very happy with the boot. Now, the Marin 8 inch boot, the specifications for that boot are that it is a eight inch tall waterproof boot. It's electrical hazard rated, oil and slip resistant, safety toe, and it meets ATSM standards. It has a mesh liner, reinforced stitching, alternate lacing system, weatherproof full grain leather, composite nano safety toe, an adjustable width insert, triple layered comfort insole with a rubber foam midsole and a rubber skinned outsole. Now, as I said, I've been wearing these in the shop every day that I've been working for about six to eight months. And at first, I was not a huge fan of the boot, but I think that was because I was actually coming out of a hiking shoe into a dedicated work boot again. So I felt it a little bit stiff. But after working in it and breaking that boot in, I am happy to say the boot is incredibly comfortable. You can wear it all day long and I notice almost zero foot fatigue after being in these boots on concrete for six to eight, well actually eight to 10 hours a day. Now they don't look as good as the day that I pulled them out of the box, but that's expected because they've been here in the shop. They've been used when I was welding and grinding and crawling around on the ground and spilling oil and transmission fluid on them and they've held up incredibly well. The good news is, is if you want to get a set of Brunt Workwear boots, you can use the discount code that I'm putting in the description below and save yourself a little bit of money. Let's get on to the questions. Okay. First question comes from, just emptied every pocket, 9420. Just emptied every pocket, that spells Jeep. I figured that one out long time ago. Hey Ian, hey Ian, will you talk more about a TJ gas tank in the back of a JK frame? Ooh, that's a very good question. So for those of you who've been following along on my builds, you know that I built a 1953 Willys wagon. I think it was maybe last year or the year before. I think it was, I think it was the year before. 1953 Jeep Willys wagon. And when I built that Willys wagon, I knew that I didn't want to run the JK fuel tank because it basically goes down the whole side of the truck. What I wanted to do is I wanted to put the tank in the back like a TJ has from the factory. So what I did was I got a savvy off-road TJ skid and then I worked on getting it to fit inside the factory JK frame. Now in order to do that, I had to make a couple of changes, which is why I don't think that this is actually something that you could do to a JK because I had to eliminate a body mount. Now in the case of my 53 Willys wagon, I was able to relocate the body mount. The problem is, is the body mount is on the inside of the frame the rearmost, rearmost section of the frame at that back cross member. What I had to do is basically remove that body mount and move it over to the outside of the frame. No big deal because I was building custom body mounts to fit my custom floor that I put inside the Willys wagon. But if you're trying to make it fit inside a JK, it's probably not going to work because I think you really need that rear body mount and to relocate it on the JK body is going to be a lot of work. But it is possible to do if you're using the JK frame for some other type of project. 
Once again, I just had to eliminate those body mounts. I did cut the rear of the frame off, but that was because I was adding a savvy off-road rear bumper, which comes with a whole new rear cross member, raises the bumper and the cross member up to give you a better departure angle on the back of the Jeep. I don't think you have to do that, but it certainly made it a lot easier to fit that TJ tank in the back. And then I simply took the gas tank, I utilized the original cross member uh, that's basically for the springs as well as the shocks, and uh, had to modify modify the TJ mount on the tank and then just build mounts for the back of the tank along that rear cross member. It's really not that difficult as I said but it really kind of is application specific. Uh, on my TJ uh, or sorry on my Willys wagon with the JK frame I'm carrying I think that tank is a 16 gallon tank and that's perfect for my little R2.8 diesel. Carries enough fuel for me to do trail ride all day and get back home uh, back into Moab if I'm taking out Moab. Thing works perfect. So there you go. TJ gas tank in the back of a JK frame. Yes, it can be done, but it really is application specific. Thank you very much. Just emptied every pocket 9520. Make sure to shoot me your mailing address so I can get you a sticker pack out in the mail. Question number two is from Chris Nelson. He says, I got one for you. I think he's trying to trick me here. Can IFS or IRS be equal to solid axle in rock crawling and how do portals come into play? Now, I believe what he's referring to is what we're seeing a lot in the world of Ultra 4 lately. So IFS obviously stands for independent front suspension and IRS stands for independent rear suspension. Now at one point in time it was pretty rare to see an IFS car competing as a 4400 car which is basically you know the ultimate rock crawler if you think about it because rock crawler trail rig because it can go fast in the desert and climb over huge rocks in the rocks. I believe that we've probably all agree that Shannon Campbell was probably the originator of IFS in that class at King of the Hammers but now we see multiple cars campaigning from many different builders all using that similar designed IFS bulkhead. Now independent rear suspension that's something that has been relatively new over the past few years and unless I'm mistaken I would probably say that Joe Thompson at UFO Fab was probably the person to sort of pioneer that. There may have been a couple other people that tried out a few things with independent rear suspension but he has gone all in and his UFO Fab cars uh, they built a bunch of them with different types of independent rear suspension and they have all been incredibly competitive at races like King of the Hammers. Now it's pretty commonplace to see what we would consider full independent cars, that would be independent front, independent rear, doing very well in that race. And I think that the reason for that has to do with the second part of his question. So the issue always has been, or the argument I should say, between IFS and solid axle is the fact that is IFS as strong as a solid axle car when you're in the rocks? And it was easy to argue before that it wasn't because we would routinely see IFS cars break during the rock trail section of races like King of the Hammers. And you didn't really see a lot of people basically wreck wheeling with IFS cars. And I think that is more about the cost of that front end. So there's the biggest difference between a solid axle and IFS. To build a well-built independent front suspension car, just that front, what we would call the bulkhead, so that would be the housing for the third member, your upper and lower A-arms, your knuckles, uh, no axle shafts, no third member, they usually start somewhere in the area of about $20,000. And the reason for that is there's a lot of labor in that front end. There is plate steel arms, the plate steel bulkhead, uh, there's just, there's just, it's just a lot of work to build that. Versus building a solid axle, if you take a spider tracks nine inch and build yourself a baller front solid axle, I mean, for a good builder, uh, if it's up underneath the chassis, that's maybe a day, maybe two at the most. Uh, if you are going to do a full weld out on that front independent, it's probably a couple weeks, maybe even a month to completely build that bulkhead into a functioning front 
axle section for your car. So the first hindrance is cost, um, but that's not what he's asking. He's asking, do I think that the independent front suspension, independent rear suspension can be as strong as solid axle on the rocks? And I think the answer to that is, if we throw money out of the question, the answer is absolutely it can be. And it can be because of the portals. Now, for those of you who don't know what a portal is, a portal box is something that attaches at the wheel end of an axle. It can go on a solid axle or it can go on an independent car. But basically what it does is the axle shaft comes in one spot in the portal and then there is usually some type of additional gear reduction. And then it, if the axle comes in here, the axle will go out below it and that's where the wheel bolts up. Now, yes, you do get more ground clearance with the portal axle because the axle has now moved up. But I think the biggest benefit is by applying that gear, ratio, that gear reduction at the wheel itself, what you're doing is you're eliminating the stress in the drivetrain from the components in the independent front or independent rear suspension system that routinely did fail. And it wasn't a failure of a, a product or a part, or it was just when you are rock crawling at an event like King of the Hammers and you are abusing this vehicle for eight to 10 hours, you're asking a lot of things like CVs, constant velocity joints, because not only is the CV having to transmit the power, but it's also having to turn and pivot. And you're working it at its max angle uh, at a very regular uh, interval inside the rock. So every time something is at its max angle, whether that's a U joint or a CV joint, that is when it's at its weakest. When a, when two C, if you, here's a perfect example. If you go and look at any diesel drag racing trucks or any type of drag racing truck that uses all wheel drive or front, they'll take a four wheel drive truck and they'll turn it into a drag truck. This is now becoming pretty common actually. If you look at how they set those trucks up, they'll actually work on the ride height so the CV shafts are perfectly flat when they wanna launch the vehicle. If the CV shaft is perfectly flat, and it enters the CV joint, and the CV joint is perfectly straight, that is when it, it is its strongest. The least chance of it breaking is when it's perfectly flat and basically creating a straight shaft. The more angle you add to it, the weaker it gets. So in rock crawling, so now you have an independent front suspension where you're taking this car, you're putting a 40 inch tall tire, you're up on a rock, you basically drop the other side out, the CV is at max angle on droop, so basically the suspension's hanging low, and then you turn the wheels, and now you got it at max angle this way, and max angle as the wheel turns, that is just a recipe for a CV joint to fail. There's nothing you can do to prevent that. You're putting that CV joint at its worst possible position and then you're hitting the gas with your 800 horsepower Dugan's race engine engine in your ultra four car. So two things the portals do. Number one, when the axles droop out now because the tire is further down because of the location of it on the portal box, we lessen the angle of that CV. So the CV is not operating at max angle anymore at droop because the CV shaft is sitting a little bit taller. Also, because we have a gear reduction out at the tire, that 800 horsepower Dugan's race engine that goes through a transmission and then a transfer case and then heads out to the differentials where it's reduced again and again and again and again to get more torque to climb over the rocks, we're able to remove some of that sort of like extra torque and put it past those components. So if we get an extra reduction at the at this portal of even a two to one or even, a, even 0 0.7 to one or 0.17 to one, we basically remove that load from the CV. So the CVs get to last a lot longer. And so do the ring gears and the drive shafts and the pinions and, and the transfer cases. Everything inside the system has to work, I guess the term would be less hard or seize less stress because of the portal. So, to answer your question, now, remember, we're not talking money here because the reality is independent front suspension, independent rear suspension, if we were to put a dollar value on that, you could probably build two complete ultra four solid axle cars for the price of one fully independent car. And that's being fair. I think you might even be able to build like two and maybe a pre-runner. Um, so we're not talking about money. We're just talking about, is it, can it be as strong? And I believe the answer to that is yes. And it's because 
of the, that portal box technology. Now, if you really want to see some cool portals, look at a company called 74 Weld. They're kind of like the guys when it comes to portals uh, in off-road, and not just off-road racing. They offer them They offer them for a Jeep JL, literally bolt-on portals. It's actually pretty cool. I drove the Jeep with them on there, and I was really really impressed. So there you go. Thank you for your question. Sorry for the long drawn out answer, but I love that technical geeky stuff about, you know, portals and driveline angles and all that kind of jazz. I think it's amazing how far the off-road sport has come just in 20 years. It just, it blows my mind. I think 20 years ago, oh man, air shocks were like leading edge technology. I mean, I, I think it's awesome. So to see the IFS, IRS, portal stuff, Oof, blows my mind. All right, so thank you, Chris Nelson. Don't forget to send me your address so I can get you a sticker pack out in the mail. Last question is from Easter Rider. You have years of mechanical knowledge. What are your strengths and weaknesses as an automotive tech? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, um, I started my life as an automotive technician. We used to just call ourselves mechanics back then. Now we call ourselves technicians, no idea why. Uh, I started as an automotive technician. I signed my apprenticeship papers when I was, uh, I believe I was 17 or 18 years old. I signed my apprenticeship papers for the first time and started working at a General Motors dealership uh, just as a general tech. Uh, in Canada, to become a mechanic, uh, you have to spend, uh, at that time, I believe it was 9,000 hours of on-the-job training uh, before you could write your mechanic's license. And the mechanic's license was basically all of the ASE tests combined into one big test. You sat down for one day and you wrote the test. And if you got a grade above, I think it was 75, you would get what's called a Red Seal certificate, which I have, which means you could work anywhere in the country. I was able to get basically two licenses because I started life in an automotive setting at a General Motors dealership, but that dealership also had a heavy truck and coach division. And so I was able to also work in that division as well. So I was able to get my automotive uh, technician license and my heavy truck and coach uh, license as, as well. So, uh, and then I spent my life basically working at General Motors dealerships and I was an automotive technician specializing in transmissions, transfer cases, transmissions, transfer cases, and differentials. So, but the question is, what are my strengths and weaknesses as an automotive uh, technician? I would say uh, probably my strengths as an automotive technician were, I consider myself fortunate in the fact that I grew up in the, uh, basically there was a, a, at a time, a split time where uh, we were basically just starting to see computers uh, inside cars, like more advanced computers than we saw before. We saw some engine control modules and some body control modules, but when I first started as a mechanic, uh, there really wasn't a computer to make the car run. It was it was less of that. There were it was more of just get the car running. You know, we had literally still had carburetors on some of the cars. Um, so I was able to basically start in that world and basically work and train up into the point where we had fully computerized cars. I didn't, I wasn't on the bench during the EV time, so I didn't have any experience in that, but I did uh, spend a lot of time through the transition of the C3 carburetor, which was a computer controlled carburetor, terrible idea. Uh, first generation fuel injection from General Motors, the very first computer controlled transmissions uh, to get into that world, and then moving up into the 4L80s and, and, the, and then the 4L60Es and the 4, 4L65, 4TC, all that. Anyway, com the computers took over in the automotive space while I was on the bench. And I consider that one of my strengths because previous to that, we were still spending a lot of time diagnosing. It wasn't as simple as the car comes in, oh, it's not running, throw this part at it, or it's not running, put that part on it. We spent a lot of time, and we were paid to do it, to, to always diagnose problems first. And I think that's one of my strengths as a mechanic is the fact that I still have that mindset. When a vehicle isn't running, I don't simply say, oh, it's gotta be, it's gotta be the computer. 
it's got to be this. I still go back to that base. Let's diagnose this problem. Let's find out what the problem is and then fix it. Let's just not just throw parts at it, which I see that happen more often. Um, I see a lot of people and I think that it's kind of like, oh, it's going to be this. Throw a part at it, throw a part at it, throw a part at it. And it's, it's not a that's not a smart way to uh, find a problem. You know, if, if you want to know what's wrong with the car, diagnose it first and then you'll only buy the part that you need. So I would say it's my strength. My weakness in the automotive technician space was always um, stuff that, that I did, didn't interest me, was things like air conditioning. Um, yeah, that'd be my biggest weakness would be air conditioning. I really didn't spend any time under, understanding or figuring out how air conditioning worked. I've trained on it and I, I understood it and I worked on it for literally like a couple weeks. And then I was like, I'm not doing air conditioning again. So I would say that's one of my weaknesses would be air conditioning. And then probably my biggest weakness is, uh, has, has always been uh, the stuff that's not really automotive technician based, like body work, paint, body, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think those would be my, my strengths and my weaknesses. Um, I think that uh, the one good thing that I have uh, that I think is also a strength is that I also, and I believe that comes from the uh, diagnose it first mentality before you, f and then fix it afterwards, is I'd, I'd never really considered myself done learning. You know, I, I, I've always tried to like find something new to figure out, you know? So if it's uh, like a perfect example, paint and body, I really kind of hit a brick wall in that world for a while. And then I decided a few years ago, you know what, I'm going to push past that and I'm going to learn paint and body. Um, um, I also did the same. I had to put air conditioning on my Willys wagon. So it was time to figure out, you know, Hey, how does this whole air conditioning thing actually work? I spent a lot of time, you know, basically getting back to my roots of, Oh, here's what this part does. Here's what that part does. All that kind of jazz. Um, so I would say that is probably uh, where, uh, where, where I'm at, is I believe that I never stop learning. Oh, I just thought of another sort of weakness that I have, and I'm, I'm trying to push past that right now, is um, yes, I did grow up in the world of computers taking over cars, but when they first went into, went into these vehicles and we were trained on and we understood what all the computers did, the word CAN bus was not in that equation. That is something that I was out of the trade when that became a regular thing. And I need to, that's the, my next sort of hurdle that I want to cross is uh, CAN bus communications. I want to learn more about that side of the automotive diagnostic scenario, I guess I should say, or world, is the CAN bus communication between multiple modules. I need to spend a little bit more time understanding that as well as EFI tuning because yes, I understand how EFI works. I understand that if I get a Holly EFI system, uh, I can hook it up and I can make it run and I can do the diagnosis in order to make it run. But when it comes time to like tuning that vehicle or tuning it with a program like HP tuners, that is another area where I am not strong. And that's sort of on my next list of what I want to learn is that type of stuff. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. You know, yes, I still think that I'm a very good mechanic, uh, but as always, as I said, I never stop learning. And I think that I'll probably never stop learning until uh, I can't work in the shop anymore. That's a great question, by the way. Hey, if you, uh, if you have a strength or a weakness or you plan to learn something new, put in the comments below. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, so let me know what you want to, what you think, or if you need help with something and you need to say, Hey, Hey, I want to learn this. Where should I start? Maybe I'll choose your question and it'll be on one of these videos. So those are our three questions for this week's Q and A. And now it's time for the, where is it now? This week's Where Is It Now is a vehicle that I probably should uh, have remembered a little bit more, um, but someone put in the comments, I was like, man, I can't believe I never talked about it. And that is the WD-40 giveaway Jeep. Uh, so for those of you who don't remember, uh, years ago, uh, I built a Jeep for WD-40 and they wanted a Jeep and I was like, hey, if you want a Jeep, it's gotta be a cool Jeep. So we got a wide open designs, one of their Jeep chassis uh, and we put, uh, basically, I just bought a YJ body, kept the grill, the hood, and the, and the windshield frame, threw everything else out, got an Aqualoo tub, and we built a giveaway, basically rock bouncer style Jeep, you know, big LS in it, turbo 400, Atlas, I think it had 14 bolt rear, Dana 60 front, I'm pretty sure that's what we ended up putting on it. Um, it was a super cool rig, and the coolest part is, it went to SEMA, 
and it got an award for best Jeep at SEMA, and it was a YJ. And now I'm super excited because this year for SEMA, the shop truck went, and uh, here's the cool story that this is a feather in my cap as far as I'm concerned. I, as a builder, have had two Jeeps at SEMA. That's it. And they've both been Jeep YJs. I think that's awesome. Anyway, so uh, the uh, the WD40 buggy uh, Jeep uh, we did we used we filmed it, got it all done, uh, took it to SEMA, and then we did the big giveaway. Uh, giveaway happened. Winner came and got the Jeep, and I believe it ended up down in Florida. Is actually where it ended up, and. Um, that's just kind of part of it. You know, when you do these giveaway cars, you never know where they're gonna end up. And that's where this one, and I don't, I don't even think, I think they were like mildly into off-roading, but not like hardcore into off-roading. So the Jeep ended up down there. Uh, from what I understand, it changed hands a couple of times. And then the last time I remember seeing it is somebody sent me a link to an eBay auction and I couldn't believe it because it was on the eBay auction. Whoever was listing it, they really didn't think it through because they didn't show any pictures of the actual Jeep. They just showed the rendering of the Jeep. And the I bookmarked the auction because I was thinking I saw it, it started at like $5,000, which blew my mind. Um, and I was planning to bid on it if it stayed that low, but I think I was out of town or something when the auction closed or traveling and therefore I didn't get the notification that the auction was closing. And the, then I went back into eBay to see what had happened and it did sell and it sold for I think less than $20,000, which was crazy. Cause I mean, just the chassis is worth like 15 grand. Um, and after that, I have no idea where it went. So um, that's kind of part of the, the thing about, you know, when you build a giveaway vehicle, you have no control over where it goes. And then, yeah, obviously once it's sold, you have no control over what happens to it. But I really would have preferred to have that end up in the hands of someone who like really, really, really liked hardcore off-road and really, really, really used it. So that is the story of the WD-40 uh, Jeep. And where is it now? The answer is, I have no idea. If you know where it is, Put it in the uh, comments below and let me know. Uh, but it ended up somewhere and hopefully somebody's using it. All right, guys. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in here to the Big Tire Garage for our Q&A session. We'll see you next time from inside the shop.